Good day and welcome to today's one-on-one -on -one session with the Minister of Parliamentary Affairs and Governance, the Honourable Gail Teixeira. Minister Teixeira, welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having um, me. Thank you, and we're pleased that you're here. I'm your host, Shaquille Bourne, and of course today we'll be discussing all things transparency and governance related. Uh, how important, how important rather, is good governance to the work of the administration? It's a critical component of democracy, and we are a government that's based on the Constitution and the laws of Ghana, and the constitutional rule of law, and therefore the areas of good governance relate to transparency, accountability, inclusion, participation. These are all the fundamental areas of governance. So it's a critical component of how our government operates, and something we're achieving to improve and keep enhancing all the time. Now, Minister, um, recently the opposition leader uh, in, a, in a recent interview in Canada spoke about a multi-party consensus for major projects. Uh, this form of shared governance, uh, while not a new idea, uh, was not necessarily done while uh, his party was in government. Um, how do you view these statements? Huh. I think that Mr. Norton is grasping at straws. The Clearly, the Constitution that was amended in 1999-2001 provided for a level of power sharing between the leading opposition and the President regarding constitutional post holders, their appointment, and constitutional bodies, their appointment. And in the first effort to do it this year, it has bombed out. He has done everything to avoid dealing with the names of persons presented by the Parliament, that had unanimous support in Parliament, as well as the names presented by the President. So for me, the proof is in the pudding, yeah. right? I judge someone from their actions, not what they say. And so the point is that the, the one huge area of constitutional appointments and constitutional commissions so they can function, look at the Judicial Service Commission, a critical person, uh, commission. Parliament approved a name, the President gave a name, and he avoids completely dealing with that issue. So the Constitution Commission expired in September 2017 and is still expired up to now. And this has to do with the appointment of judges. So, you know, the, the, the Mr. Norton blows hot and cold as far as I'm concerned. So when we get to this point about uh, multi-party uh, consensus, in all democracies, where is that forum? Is Parliament. Yes. Parliament is the forum. And that is where the engagement of government and opposition, remember in opposition, this this uh, Parliament, it has another party. It is not APNO AFC. And this is, APNO AFC doesn't want them, the gentleman who is the Deputy Speaker of the House to sit on committees, doesn't even recognize him when he puts up his name to speak. The man has to go directly to the Speaker or me to get his name put on the speaker's list. So, again, contradictions. Uh, the, but when we're looking at the budget process and what are the indications, 2020, 21, and 2022, what are the major projects? We've announced those in the budget. Budgetary allocations have been made. If there are problems before you speak, you talk. But you can also have an open door arrangement where the leading opposition will say, Mr. President, I want to speak to you about this. But of course, this is a man who says, I'm not shaking their hands until these issues of race, etc., are dealt with, until people, all people are treated fairly. So he's caught himself in a conundrum of contradictions. You know, he says one thing and he does another thing. So the, yes, the multi-stakeholder multi party consensus is a complicated thing. So for example, Check it. If, if, for example, the president appoints, uh, the cabinet sits down with the experts and investors and so on, and we want to do the pipeline. Example, Wales. The opposition doesn't agree with it. And in a multi state would that mean it wouldn't be done? Because you're talking about consensus, not dialogue, not conversation, yeah. not not exchanging ideas and seeing if we can come to consensus. It's almost consensus and therefore no government in the world 
no government in the world that is elected at a democratic election is ever going to agree that the only way they can move forward with the infrastructure projects is with the consensus of the opposition or anybody else. The whole constitutional framework provides that the executive is the one that has the authority to deal with the resources and the development of the country, number one. Number two, it says Article 13, that people, the people of our country, their organizations must have a participation in the decision making of matters that affect their lives, right? So participation, inclusion is critical, but it does not mean that if there's no agreement, you can never move forward because that pipeline, for example, is part of the low carbon development strategy, energy mix that says over the next umpteen years, we're going to wean ourselves over time from fossil fuels. We will engage with other types of alternative energy, gas, very natural gas, hydro, wind, solar. So you're saying to a government, any government that's democratically elected, that you can't move on anything until we say so. Yeah. Now, if that's the case, Shaquille, look at the constitutional appointments. You have the Police Service Commission approved in committee unanimously. The four men unanimously approved on the House by the same lady opposition who happened to be in the same day he was elected lady opposition and was sitting there when the vote was taken. Right? Let's take that as an example of good faith. So we proceed now. What the Constitution is, choose a chairman. The president says to the lady opposition, here's the name I'm suggesting. And that becomes a big no action. He's talking about the appointment of the chancellor and the chief justice. And he's not dealing with this. He's not dealing with that. And now the matter is in court. And the court ruled. The chief justice ruled on the issue. And now they're appealing that. Well, if that's an example of how we deal with consensus building, then this country ain't going to go nowhere, we're, Shaquille. We wouldn't get anywhere. We're going to be stuck. Every time you go to take a step forward, you you got to consult. And you got to get his agreement. So he might as well run for election and get into government. If that is the position of the leading opposition, get into government and then you will make your decisions. There is room always for consultation, always. But there must never be a position that, that any government that's elected is prevented from moving forward with what are transformative projects to help the country. You know, yes, there are issues that if there are violations of rights and there are violations of this, they're the courts. The Constitutional Rights Commission, these are avenues for redress. But you can't say to a government, and certainly, as you know, when they were in government, none of this happened. I mean, you know, again, contradictions. I don't know if the APNU AFC has amnesia or they have very convenient memories. They just block out what they did. So in the five years, you had laws come before the parliament no consultation. In fact, you had the Prime Minister at the time suspending the standing orders to have the bill debated first, second, third reading one day. Rushed. Rushed. And these were big bills. So the uh, cybercrime one, which made it um, that if you, the, the sedition, which had been removed when we got into government in the first government of the PNP, sedition was on the books. It was removed by us in the 1990s, the first government, and was out of our law until it was reintroduced under the Cybercrime Act, right? You have the Anti-Terrorism Act that has 10 times death penalty, 10 times in the bill, no consultation. So the issue of, you know, their memory, they brought, as you may recall, that they, when we were in a minority government, they cut our budget by 90 billion, 2012, 2013, and 2014. What impact did that have on our people? What did that impact it had on the programs for agriculture, for roads, for housing, for our Indian development? It cut all of that, including, remember, they were cutting the salaries yeah. and all those things, right? So that's, so they have, the opposition has the power in parliament to do these things. And they used it in the 2011 and 2015. In government in 2015, 2020, not one motion we brought, not one amendment of the bill we brought was approved by them. Everything was thrown out. Even as remember the Walter Rodney Commission of Inquiry, 
which had started under Dr. Uh, President Ramachandran, and which Mr. Granger abandoned, and when I demanded that the report and the motion come to Parliament and debated it, and called on them, look, their basic recommendation to improve security, improve trust in the society. Things we can all agree on. We can all agree. This is nonpartisan issues. Yeah. This is what we sh the direction we should be going in. Defeated. Defeated. We had to bring back the whole thing into Parliament to now ensure that the report is now put on the Parliament website, that they, they, this government agrees to the recommendations of that. So the, the issue is that Mr. Norton, is, as I said, blows hot and cold, but he cannot respond to the things when they were in government in the 2015, 2020. And he can't absolve himself from that. He can't absolve himself from that. And his party doesn't wish to. You know, so when we get to some of the other things he's advocating, they're actually not quite different from Mr. Granger. They're actually fundamentally not different from Mr. Granger. So that there is a, a what you call, commonality of views or philosophy between the leading opposition, Granger, and the Apno AFC. You know, they haven't fundamentally changed no. at all. No. And, let, and let's turn uh, to a bit about 2020. Uh, we know that Ghana's democracy was tested yes. heavily, and yes. the entire world basically reported on that. Yes. Uh, but the strength of our institutions and leaders um, were able to hold the government at that time uh, to account. Right. How has the PPPC uh, administration been able to achieve inclusion effectively, especially when we speak about the, the equitable distribution of resources in Ghana? Yeah, I think, well, first of all, two things in that, the institutions. The institutions that in the 2020 period of the post-election that were resilient, were resilient, judiciary. Judiciary was resilient. Despite differences of views, despite difference of decisions, the resilience of the judiciary to defend the Constitution, and that's what they're asked to do all the time, and they did it. The issue showed that the GCOM was a, an organization that was porous to control by actual GCOM officials and the then government. And the government also then was at that time violating the Constitution in a variety of ways. What we have now, I think, from August 2020 to now, is a series of measures to strengthen the judiciary, the um, justice sector reform, the criminal justice sector reform, to strengthen the ability and the capacity of the judiciary to do their mandate. You have the legislature, complicated. <laughs> Has had complicated, <laughs> and I don't drama. think I don't think Shakila is going to go away. Only to be honest, <laughs> yeah. I think we're in for more kind of that behavior, and then you and of course you have, as you know, the suspension of the eight people, and they run to court. Now that's an extraordinarily interesting case, because the judiciary, the three branches of government, are not supposed to intervene on each other or interfere with each other. So we're very interested to watch how the judiciary deals with that issue. Yeah because the Constitution talks about the Parliament regulates itself yeah, and regulates its, its behavior. Rules, right? yeah. So, but the, the issue of inclusion and participation. So I think that there's been work in strengthening the institutions, strengthening the ministries, their systems, um, manuals, all these things are important because systems are different from individuals and that you want things to work properly. Laws have been amended. We have clarified a number of laws where they um, there may have been ambiguity. We're bringing the um, electoral reform laws, the two, the ROPA and the registration, when we return to Parliament, and we're having a big consultation in October um, with civil society to look at those amended, um, amended provisions. Then we have, okay, one of the issues of inclusion and participation is that one of the elements has to do with information sharing. Whatever false there may be with this government that people believe in, they cannot say that the availability of information, not only through the traditional newspapers, the government media, but social media, websites, uh, Facebooks, Twitter, and everything. So you're seeing, for example, in Bartica, the notice of the minister coming to deal with title in there on a certain date. You see the notices going 
to the regions on Facebook saying that the GRA is going into Bidmas so-and-so date. You see today the announcement by Marad that they will be having online uh, which about booking for yeah. Parika to Supanam yeah. on so every single day uh, information has been churned out to make sure that you have one an informed population the, one of the fundamentals of democracy is to make sure that people are informed what the government's doing what's going on around them with this emergency what they should do a range of things and I think we are flooding the system with that of course we are challenged because not all the country is connected yeah and so that is a, a separate project that is ongoing under the office of the prime minister to to um, to connect the country, to have the ICT hubs in every Indian village, interior areas. That is progressing step by step. And so the issue of information, participation now, I don't think, I would be surprised at people saying that the inclusion and participation is they're not being included and participated. And let's deal again at the community level. Unlike the former government, who uh, ministers were invisible or unreachable or untouchable and surrounded by huge bodies of uh, security, including the pre then president, this president, this cabinet, is out there at community meetings, bottom house meetings, consultations. Uh, the president going out at four in the morning to meet the fishermen and all this. This is a very special, uh, what do you call it, characteristic of this government. And it mustn't be um, treated in a, as if this is normal, because it's not normal. I can bet almost any country in the region does not have a cabinet that's doing this. So that the visibility, the accessibility, the minister's WhatsApp, numbers are up, their Facebooks are up, people are counting them directly. I have a problem with old age pension, I have a problem with this, I have a problem with that. And the efforts to make representation. And it's not just something being done in election time. No, 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 no. Yeah. It started from the, the go. Exactly. And it continues. I mean, I, I, I don't deal with old age pension, that's not my mandate. But the number of people with old age pension, NIS, issues with house lot, issue with disabilities and stuff like that, public assistance, they, they look for an MP to represent them, and I do. And we get through in a number of the cases. Uh, some take longer than others. But the issue that each minister has been instructed by the president to be responsive, to take people seriously, and to represent them as best as you can. There's some issues that need to go into court, yeah. battles between people over that. Yeah. There's this, we, we can't deal with that. But the issue is that the inclusion and participation this issue that has been raised by Norton that first you're not including and participating, yet when you go to villages that somehow in Mr. Norton's mind, they have a transport on. And I believe that there's no transport that any political party has on any part of Ghana. That's my belief. And so I don't believe we have a transport on any part of Ghana. That is our workers' political parties who represent people and we do the best we can. So Mr. Norton can't get his cake and eat it all the time. He wants to say, you don't go to, you ignore and, and leave out the communities that supported the Afghan FC. Yet, when the government goes to Buxton, goes to Ithaca, goes to Mocha, it's a big issue. It's a big issue. Yeah. So what is it they want? They would prefer, actually, that the government never goes and so they can always so that it could be a problem. So that the, that that you see the government's ignoring. So they they want the cake and eat it, and they can't get it because this government is going to all the communities, and the president is, and leaders of the party and the government are going to different areas, and people ask you for things, the road, the school. You have to abide by that. You have to try and help people, and if we can't do it in this year budget, we'll put it in next year budget, and we tell people that, the. This issue of the points that have been raised by Mr. Norton about discrimination, and most offensively, his call, his statement that uh, we're an apartheid government. This is apartheid in Guyana. Well, you're young. You didn't grow up in all the struggles to end apartheid in South Africa. Yeah. You know, I did. And therefore, it, it, it horrifies me that 
a so-called responsible leader would make that accusation about our party in his country. Apartheid is institutionalized racism, institutionalized by law, by systems, by measures, to make one set of people be unequal to others. He knows that. He says he's an international, what do you call, uh, specialist in, in foreign relations. That's what he says he is. He says he taught at the University of Ghana. And he knows, knows that there is no sniff of apartheid in Guyana. There is no institutionalization of racism. There are prejudices in Guyana. Our people have prejudices against each other. Yeah. We, have to, we have to be factual, but that's not the state. That's not the state, state and that's not sponsored. the constitution. Yeah. Apartheid is state-sponsored racism and discrimination. Individuals have their own prejudices, whether it's religion, whether it's gender, whether it's politics, whether it's race and cultural. Those are prejudices that individuals have. The state in Ghana, as represented by our government, cannot and does not have any kind of measures or institutionalization that says one set of people can't get and the other people can. What we do have to do, though, Sakil, is to right some wrongs. Yes. So when we look at what Mr. Granger did in the five years, fired 1,972 Amerindian community service officers, fired 7,000 sugar workers, not all were Indian, and fired about 2,000 odd public servants. Filled it with their uh, acolytes. Some were qualified, some were not. Therefore, in this equation is also to make sure that every guy needs of every color can get a job in the public service, in the GDF, in the Ministry of Home Affairs, with the Ghana Police Force, the fire, the prison, the judiciary, etc., etc. It's the right of everybody and young people coming up. They get their degree, they finish their CXC, they want to work in government. Then they must be allowed to once there's space, once there's vacancies, yeah. once we can accommodate. And so this issue of the mantra of Mr. Norton about apartheid and racism. He talks about the use of natural resources as a, a way of saying that this is not inclusion, this is not participation, we're not dealing fairly with resources. The COVID cash grants went to every household. It may be possible that some people were not there at the time, that there was only one household who could get it in a house. Yeah. There were cases like that. And so we have to deal with that reality. And if, as a political opposition member, when I was a political opposition member, and I felt that someone was being treated unjustly, I called a relevant minister and I said, this case is, is, is not nice. What are you guys doing to these people? And so I know I, Amna Ali was the Minister of Social Protection. There are a number of occasions I made representation to her on what I felt were unjust measures or behavior by her ministry or another ministry against people. That's what MPs are for. That's what they're elected for. And so the no system is perfect. The disabilities grant. This is based on disability, not on race. Exactly. You know? So you can't make that a, a, a thing. You can't make that. You know, the issue is that children are born with these uh, with these disabilities or they acquire them in life. You can't. The issue of the um, the the other the hinterland and, and so on. I know in the region I represent, which is Region 7, we went to areas that I know no Apple person ever been into in terms of the COVID grant. The mi every mining community settlement was included. Every Amarindian village was included in that outreach. And so we went everywhere to all the, the communities. It didn't matter what color they were, didn't matter what they did. Once they filled the criteria, there's a household and they would get it. So the, the, the issue of housing, under their regime in 2016, people had paid for their house lot before. We're told by the Ministry of Housing, you got to wait. You got to wait a year or so before we give you a transport and we'll decide about that. Other times, people waited. That's why we have this backlog of over 68,000 
yeah. applicants waiting and you're telling us that you were fair. First of all, they weren't doing their jobs, forget about not being fair. But you're talking about 2,000 applications you're dealing with a year. And we're dealing, what, five, ten thousand 10,000 a year? Same, same, same government structure. Same structure, same, same majority, yeah. same people. Yeah. Right? Um, and so the issue of housing, which I think is the jewel in the crown for our country, um, it is a model housing program to give particularly low-income people land and housing. It is a way of creating new communities, of breaking the, with, unintentionally, when we started, this was not the purpose, but 2015, we realized, shoot, um, because people were moving, regardless of their ethnicity, to new settlements, new communities. And that's a good thing for us, because then they learn to live together, and they don't have some of the same, what you call, hang-ups, as from the old villages they yeah. came from, that came out of the violence of the 60s, for example. And so this is, these are good developments. The fact that women, regardless of race, are able to own property in Ghana. They're not married, they're single parents. They're even. The number of women who own property in this country through the housing program is a phenomenal example for the entire Latin America and the Caribbean. It doesn't exist anywhere else. So if I'm going to say that these resources are not being shared, well, who isn't getting? Who isn't getting? You have the cash care program that went to every region, every school in Ghana. What was the criteria? The child must be registered in school. That was it. And so why, why make all these initiatives um, doubted? As I said, there's possibly in everything you do, there is a percentage that will feel dissatisfied, that may have fallen through the cracks, somebody did something wrong, some people got lost, whatever. And these, in many cases, can be rectified, but someone needs to represent. Yeah. And if it isn't a leading opposition, it will be we representing the communities ourselves with what we see, what we learn of the problems they have. So I, th I think that the, if he is trying to prove a point, then he has to be able to show. He can't say that, oh, uh, indo guyanese are taking over the public service or whatever. The fact that the majority on, in the public service have been one ethnic group. And if it is 20%, 25% other groups, what's wrong with that? Aren't we all Guyanese? Aren't we all allowed to be here? We've chosen to be here. Many people have chosen to live outside, but the, most of us, we're here, and we don't see ourselves going anywhere, yeah. particularly with what's going on now in Ghana, particularly with the future yeah. of Ghana, the young people like yourself have more to be cautiously optimistic about than any other generation in our country. No other generation has been able to feel this energy, this hope that we see now. It has never happened before. We've been sucked under by political conflicts and ethnic insecurities. And sometimes in, in the years of trying to make accommodation with the opposition, whether it was headed by Hoyt, by Corbyn, and now by Harman, or now, uh, what you call, Norton. Sometimes we have slowed down the pace of what we're doing, and sometimes got entangled in like a never-never world where you couldn't resolve, and so you're stuck, you can't move. That's not going to happen this time. We're not going to be dissuaded and by bringing out these transformative projects. And many of them are publicly available. And there's no problem with any political party or any organization saying they'd like to have consultation on this. They'd like to see it. Could you show the plans? I remember, I know I'm going on a bit, but I remember with Mr. Granger in opposition, they wanted to see Amila Falls. They wanted to know everything about Amila Falls. And President Ramachan, with, uh, uh, with the technical people, invited the Apnu AFC to come before him. I was there, Dr. Ramachan was there. And the technical people did a whole PowerPoint presentation on a mile and where it was going and how much it was going to cost and da 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 da. And then at the end of it, the president handed over a stack of binders this high on the documents. Now, under the Commission, the uh, Access to Information Act in Ghana, we, we don't have to give 
what are commercial undertakings and negotiations now in process to anybody? Yeah. That's internal. They were given to them. I remember Mr. Greenwich being told by Mr. Granger to fetch out the binders. And I must say, I had a little laugh because you couldn't see him behind the binders. But they had it all. Yeah. All the maps, all the, the what you call costings, the, everything. Full disclosure. Full disclosure. But they still went in Parliament and twice defeated the bill that would allow the miner to go, go on ahead. Defeated twice the, the bill to do with um, increasing the debt loan, the schedule level, so that we could go ahead with it. So what are we going to talk about a miner now? Are we going to go back and say, could you? are you going to agree with a miner now? Yeah. Well, they're not going to. They can't take skin off their nose to do that. They've gone too far down the line attacking it to reverse. The point of no return. Yeah, you, and, and you know in politics, politicians have to learn that you never burn all your bridges. And they've burned all their bridges. Consistently they burn all their bridges and then know how to cross back over. And then talk philosophically about having a multi-party consensus arrangement. You know, So I'm not saying there isn't room for, for consensus building or conversation or dialogue. But we have to also deal with reality and history and what has been the experience and most recent of all is the experience with the constitutional constitutional bodies. That's the most recent. So it's not I'm talking ten years ago under Hoyt or Grange, I'm talking about what was it, three months ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Minister, before we wrap up uh, that, that 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 segment, um, you spoke about the administration's efforts to ensure uh, inclusion in Guyana. Mm. Do you think that the statements by uh, the opposition leader and um, those are part of the group about racism mm. um, in the functioning of government, do you think it's an attempt to distract from what the administration is yeah. actually doing? Yeah. 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 I, I, that has always been the mantra of the PNC whenever the PP is in government. And they reverse it, of course, when they're in government. but. That has been the mantra that's gone on from 92 to 2015, and then it was silent until now. So that it is, you see, they don't have much to hold on to. The, when we talk about consultation and inclusion participation, there are many stakeholders in this country. You have layers of government, that is village councils, Amarindian village councils, NDCs, RDCs, MPs, the political parties. You have also community groups, communities that have a voice. Then you have the, the, the civil society bodies, the religious bodies, Christian, Hindu, Muslim, trade unions, private sector, um, labor, uh, what you call women, Amerindian organizations, youth organizations. These are all part of the participation and inclusion. Yeah. PNC is one. And yes, it does have, it did get votes. It has a representation in Parliament. But it does not speak for all these bodies. It does not speak. And so what we are doing as a government, we have stakeholder forums that, in terms of a minister having a bill to bring forward, like the local content and that resource fund, uh, Minister Vikram Barrett had his consultations, Attorney General. The ones on the electoral reform, those were posted on the Facebook of my ministry. We are now organizing a large consultation before we go back to Parliament on the bills. We have um, we have stakeholder forms such as in my ministry. You have um, I created an anti-corruption body that is sixteen agencies, and which we've had two workshops on anti-corruption in Guyana in this year alone. We have a national coordinating body to do with human rights, human rights bodies, so that to look at how we're reporting, what is our monitoring, and in what way are we, we complying with the recommendations that are made to us. We have the National Stakeholders Forum, which is the one we'll hold the meeting with the, um, on the electoral laws. So we've been meeting in that group as well, even with COVID, using uh, Zoom, this meeting coming up will be in person to get away from the COVID issue. So there are layers, I'm just giving you one example, mine. But when you look at Minister Priya Manikchan and education and dealing with transformation education policy, when you look at Minister Vindi in terms of suicide and child care and, and domestic violence, 
It is all involving other actors. Everything involves other actors. All our programs include civil society organizations as well as police and stuff like that. Attorney General, in terms of the anti-money laundering areas that come under him, is inclusive of other organizations, um, not just um, the government agencies. So if you look at every sector, you can see that there are other actors. Now, clearly, opposition is a key actor, but it's not the only actor. Yeah. It's not the only actor. And it needs to comprehend that if it's singing so far out of tune to the rest of the country, it'll be left behind. Because if you talk to the average man and woman on the street, they want to do better, they want more money, they want a car, they want a house, they want a better life for their children, they want their children to grow up and be somebody. This is the, the hope of every family. And if we can, as a government, bring those dreams to reality or to realization, then we are building a better society for our people. And I, and I think that was um, actually cited in the recent IMF report that commended the government exactly. for it strengthening its anti-corruption uh, framework yeah. and uh, fiscal transparency. Yes, and I'm proud of that report because I've seen a number of articles for IMF reports that are very harsh and yeah. very difficult. So this one is actually very good in terms of including the kind of programs we had to with the COVID and the impact and what were the measures we've taken on to cushion the impact on the Guyanese population, cushion the impact on the economy. And we were praised for those initiatives too. And so, but we're in a, in a world that is very uncertain about many things. Yeah. And so we will we will have to keep adapting and changing uh, to, to a number of things that we can, that are exogenous to us that we can't control. But I think that um, the society now, Guyana, Guyana want want the country to move forward. They're tired, they've been tired of the past, particularly the young generation. They want to get on with it. They don't, many of them don't necessarily want to go and live abroad. They might want to take a walk, as we say. Yeah. But they don't want to, and, and they recognize things are tough out there too. Yeah. Very tough in terms of jobs and everything else. So the younger generation is benefiting. And then you have the National Youth Advisory Council of the president which is giving the youth a voice of their own through a mechanism designed by the president. And, and we have to build on that. These are initiatives to build inclusion, participation, and uh, an area areas of sp what I call spatial opportunities for people to engage, but not always to agree, yeah. but to engage. Because we must disagree, Minister. Yeah, you know, I mean, but engage in a respectful way. Yeah in a way that treats each person as equal and coming to the table equally so that we can engage in a respectful manner and, and out of the wisdom of human beings to find answers to some of our issues that we have. But this name calling and trying to, what you call, uh, castigate a whole set of people under the rubric of apartheid is absolutely unhelpful it's and not, certainly not real. Yeah, it's not going to get us anywhere. No. It, it just makes mockery out of the lived experiences of, of persons, uh, particularly in South Africa. Absolutely. But Minister, let's let's turn to LGE before uh, we conclude. Um, as it relates to the voters list, uh, can you please explain the views of the government on the way forward um, and whether the calls by the opposition uh, are intended to derail um, local government elections? Well, I mean, a number of things to do with local government elections are outside of us completely. That's GCOM and how it will manage elections. The Constitution makes them the body to manage regulate yeah. elections. So the determination of time and when, we have nothing to do with that. But the issue of which uh, the mantra, uh, again, the mantra of Mr. Norton and the APNO AFC to do with new clean list, new biometrics, um, the resignation and removal of the chair and the resignation and removal of the CEO uh, are the four mantras. And I think, yes, it is the first two have to do with trying to explain to their supporters why they lost the election. The second issue, though, they are, all four together are sinister in the sense that, in the sense that they are, they are focusing on disenfranchising 
voters, particularly those that are overseas. And so when we look at 2020 election, all the analyses done by the observer missions, not one of them says that the list was the problem. The list was not the problem. Nor was the biometrics the problem. What was the problem was the GCOM officials who refused to declare the statements of poll and the results as they came in. Yeah. That was where the problem was, in collusion with the GCOM officials and the former government. So there was never, never been an issue that the list was a problem. In countries where you have continuous registration, in, especially in the Caribbean, it is not unusual for the list of voters of those 18 and above being relatively high to the population. So Mr. Norton claims 90%, it's not 90%. The relativity of the voters to the list the population is approximately uh, 70%, right? Now, in all of these, in all the studies that have been done, it shows that in some cases, the population um, includes non-resident persons who cannot vote in the elections. It also includes um, persons who have died, persons who um, have fully renounced their citizenship, therefore they're not entitled to vote, but they're still on the voters list. And obviously they would not be allowed to vote. So the, the issues of this, what do you call a boogie? Mr. Mr. Norton is very, quite good at creative, at creating uh, boogeymen, you know? And one of his boogeymen is a clean and voters list. There has not been one issue to show that the list was a problem. Now, let us say that the 600 people who are on the list, and you have 700 odd thousand population. If, for example, at the 2020 elections or earlier, you had about 599,000 voting, you'd say, mm, something a little bit fishy here, right? But 2011, where Mr. Granger and the, and, the, and the AFC, the two parties combined, had one seat above the government. The 2015-2020 list and the 2020 list are all the same list. And that, in fact, at no point, although we had 600 on the voters list, in 2020 it was 400,000 that voted, right? In the previous year, it was also 400,000 that voted. So. The issue is that the, the, the measures we have in place at the polling station, the, the folios with the people's photograph, their by data, voter place of residence, etc., right where they live, um, the checks and balances that go through, the scrutinizers for polling agents from every political party have a right to be there. And if someone doesn't look like the folio, they can question the presiding officer. They check the people's fingers to see if they voted before. They have to produce some form of whether um, their passport or their ID card or whatever. But even if they don't have any of that, they can be allowed to vote with their photograph looking the same. These are measures to prevent fraudulent voting, rigging, right? So that there's nothing in the 2020 election or the 2015 election to show that there was this multi, multi-voting and, and these all these strange two hundred odd thousand zero uh, report voted. from the observers actually no and the observers did not exactly and in, in fact said categorically the Caricom observer mission categorically said that this was this this was manufactured this was manufactured by the by those elements so the clean voters list we obviously constantly want to make sure the list is sanitized and therefore the amendment we're bringing. Um, on the registration list is to ensure the commission registration on a regular basis makes it part of their duty to ensure that those who are dead are removed. And the only way you can remove a dead is by a certificate, death certificate yeah. that's issued by GRA, GRO. So the the systems you have in place are good. The voting at the place of poll, that was something we fought about in 89, 90, 91. The election was postponed twice to get that piece of legislation in and to get, um, what you call, Hoyt to agree to it. Voting at the place of poll is sacrosanct. Once you can collect those and you vote and count at the place when you get a statement of poll, 
that was the resilience of the election machinery, of the election of 2020, was the statement of support were what was saved, yeah. democ saved democracy yeah. and the recount, of course. So that this issue of clean voices and the biometrics, I believe that Mr. Norton, we have biometrics for fingerprints, for face. If he wants to include our biometrics for the iris, for your eyes, in what way will that help the voter? Because sacrosanctioning all of this is the voter's right to vote, yeah. unimpeded. <coughs> and so measures must be placed to make sure there's no rigging, no fraudulence, no multi voting, multi voting. But also, we cannot put impediments in the place of the voter. So you add on new, what, what new biometrics do you want to put in? The only one I can think of is the one with the, the eye, like when you go to US immigration. <laughs> yeah. You know? That's the only one I can think about. I don't know what other one. Um, but will that, so if you have, don't have a machine in, in some part of the interior, they can't check your iris and what happens. So essentially making vote. it harder for people to vote. Yeah, and the point is that the, the, you cannot, and I think that is, the whole strategy, of course, is they want a new voters list, they want a new house-to-house -house registration, and they want to um, new biometrics. And it is not the intention, I believe, is to strike off people from the voters list. You know, the court ruled in August 2019 that there's no residency requirement in our constitution. It was there in the pre pre independence and there when before we brought the 1980 constitution, and it was it, it was omitted in the 1980 constitution deliberately by the then government. That's Mr. Burnham. So there's no residency requirement. You're a Guyanese, you could go and live any part of the country. You get registered if you want to come back and vote there, or you can change your address. If you're overseas, you have a right, and you're on the list. If you want to spend your money, if you want to spend your money, you're, you will have a say in the elections in Ghana, then you got to catch your flight, pay for your flight, and come home and do it. But the majority of those overseas don't do it. Exactly. Because of the cost to, to, to pay your airfare, to come and stay here, and, and so forth. So the, the issue of trying to say that we'll have this uh, new voters list, I think the intention goes back to August 2019, July 2019, when they wanted to scrap the database, the NRR, which was brought in after the 2008 House House elections, uh, House House registration. Sure which made that the mother of all databases. That was agreement with the opposition leader. It was signed between um, the various political parties, GCOM and the ABC EU countries. And so this, this new conjecture is, I think, to do with delaying elections, finding all sorts of excuses, and trying to find alternatives to make sure that the PEP government isn't able to stay in government for long. And and so the, the, there is a sinister part to this. It isn't only about um, trying to convince their, their supporters that, you know, we really won the elections. These people stole it from us because of, and they didn't have a clean voters list. In fact, uh, I was doing some research the other day. The only time they start talking about house house registration was when the no confidence motion passed. That was December 2021, no, 2018, sorry. And Mr. Granger went to Bartica, and Mr. Nagamucho, the whole bunch of them went to Bartica and had a rally. And Mr. Granger is the first time he says, this is March 2019, that there are 200,000 incorrect data entries on the voters list. And therefore, we need to have new house house registration. That was 2019. And that mantra continued. And the court ruled on it, and it's continued up to now. That the, the issue is that it appears to be only when we're in government, the list is a problem. It's not a problem when they got the, the um, they had the majority in the opposition in 2011 to 2015. Mm. No, in 2015, 2020, same voters mm. list. Same voters list. And so 
the um, I, I think that they're clearly the issues they want to say to their supporters. I'm not sure if all the supporters are buying it, and that also to prepare the ground, prepare the ground for the future. You know, to say that we champion the clean voters list and the PP didn't agree. We champion biometrics and they didn't agree. To. Now additional issues why you will question a new election, whether it's the local government elections coming up or whether it's the next general year. Yeah. You're laying the basis to question that election even before it's... So you can say, oh, we were talking about this before. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, they're preparing the ground. They're setting the stage in other ways. Minister Tashir, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this discussion. I hope that our viewers would have really taken away um, and fully understand what is happening um, in Guyana so with, with respect to government projects and, of course, um, some of the noise that is trying to distract uh, from what is the good that is actually happening in the country. I'm your host, Shikil Bourne, and we've just had Minister of Parliamentary Affairs and Governance on our one-on-one -on -one discussion. Thank you, and we'll see you another time. Thank you Thank very you. much for having me.